Dean. It's January 15th, 2012. I have zero concept of time. I don't know if it's day or night. My body shutting itself down. The only thing that my body craves are the drugs that put me in this place. It was rejecting everything else. I had just experienced my first seizure from drug withdrawal. I laid in a hospital bed, helpless, detoxing, staring at a plate of cold tuna casserole that sat on the table next to me. It was day three of seven in detox, the hardest day. My body was bearing the brunt of the physical war waged against itself from prescription pain med abuse. I knew if I could just feed my body some nutrition that I could find relief. But I mean, who even likes tuna casserole, right? So harder than any training or competition as a pro athlete, I mustered all the strength that I had to reach out to try to grasp the food, my hands barely willing to open. Commanded my body to take it to the microwave, but when I did, a tremor short-circuited my stability and I fell to the ground powerlessly. Shamed and humiliated, on my hands and knees, I began scraping up lumps of tuna casserole and broken plate with my bare hands. My hands trembled, my limbs jerked uncontrollably, and my eyes poured out with tears. My spirit was crushed. The nurses rushed in and restrained me for fear that I was going to try to cut myself with the broken plate. They lifted my incapable body off of the floor. Just weeks prior, I was playing in the NFL for the Seattle Seahawks in front of a stadium of 80,000 people. How did I end up in this place? The answer, I was living without a gut and I was only using one brain. If I asked you to draw a picture of the brain, you'd draw this, right? But the organ that I should have been tuned into was in fact this, the stomach, the gut. I bet at some point someone has told you to trust your gut instinct, right? Which means listen to your inner voice, your intuition. And if you're good and you're experienced at this, you know that it's oftentimes correct, even more so maybe than your conscious mind. Think about a time in the last week when you felt something about a situation or a person. You didn't know why but you felt certain that it was true. There's power in the gut, and science actually backs this up, this theory that there's two brains. And these two organs, they have a lot of undeniable similarities. The gut operates on the enteric nervous system, or the ENS, while the brain in the head operates on the central nervous system, the CNS. Now, both share over 30 identical neurotransmitters, such as acetylcholine, dopamine, serotonin, in fact, over 90% of the body's dopamine, excuse me, serotonin, is in the gut, and approximately 50% of it's dopamine. Now, this thing, the ENS, the CNS, they communicate together, but this is interesting because the ENS can operate autonomously, even though what we understand about the CNS is it's the main operating system. Now, the ENS and the CNS communicate via the vagus nerve. Now, I know a lot about vagus, but I didn't know anything about the vagus nerve, so I looked it up. The vagus nerve, when severed, the ENS can continue to function. I bet you guys didn't think you were going to get a science lesson from an NFL player today, huh? But here's the, the, what that human physiology tells me. It tells me that there, the fact is that there's two cooks in the kitchen, right? Both can offer information to guide action. Both give prompts, and without the ability to let one lead or have perfect harmony between the two, we can impair our truest inclinations. So, the gut has massive value. I, I, probably, I probably should have said this. I could have realized what took me to drug detox two years earlier. Because I was on the side of the road, my car had broken down, my girlfriend's with me, we're waiting for roadside assistance. And this is when we witnessed the most gruesome and horrific motorcycle accident. Father and a son traveled together on a bike when a car made an unexpected lane switch running into the two throwing the father over the handlebars at 75 miles an hour. He tumbled end over end, crashing into the center median as the bike laid down at pinned the young boy. Sliding sideways across the interstate, a car in the innermost lane ran over the boy and the bike, and the impact caused everything to burst into flames. All of this happening no more than 50 feet away from me. I wish I could tell you that I ran toward the wreckage to perform a life-saving act, but I didn't. 
Instead, I reached for my cell phone to dial 911. And I look up to find my girlfriend wearing nothing but a swimsuit cover up and flip flops, and she is the one running toward danger, toward two mangled bodies, one still pinned under a burning motorcycle. Later, when I asked her why she didn't hesitate, she looked at me and said, I don't know, I didn't think, I just trusted my gut because if that was my dad or my brother, I'd expect someone to do the same. You see, my, my, my girlfriend, she showed what gut instincts can do, right? She trusted her gut. Now, I learned two things that day. The first, I was gonna marry this incredible woman, and I did. And the second, that I froze. Sure, someone needed to dial 911. But how many other drivers had already had their phone on their, their uh, hand on their phone to do this necessary but uninspiring move? See, this didn't make sense to me because at the time, I'm an NFL starting linebacker, right? A modern day gladiator. Someone that should have prided himself on rising to the occasion when it mattered most. How could I apply valor every day on the football field? But in the case of a life and death scenario, do nothing. See, the father lived, son did not. My wife relied on instincts which called her into action while my head rationalized because of fear and I cowardly played it safe. So if the gut is this powerful, this valuable, and psychology reminds us of the purpose of intuition, why do so many of us here in this room today do our best to rationalize it away? It's because of fear. This battle is happening constantly. It's a battle between intellect and instinct, right? And fear locks us into conformity, okay? It, it makes us buy into others' expectations for our lives and then it robs us of our true inclinations. So why did I not act on the, on the uh, uh, motorcycle crash? It was because of this. Why did I stuff my face full of pain medication? It was because of the fear of an identity crisis. When I got hurt in football, I didn't know who I was without football. So the idea of going back to something that I wasn't elite at struck fear into my heart. I didn't have a gut instinct. It led me to a place that it was easier just to grab that and numb myself than to step into that uncertainty. How many of you, raise your hand if you've ever been the last pick at anything in your life? Last pick, yeah. Well, I was the last pick in the 2008 NFL draft, making me Mr. Irrelevant. The title given to the last pick because they rarely make the team, but I put everything that I had into overcoming that title. And I changed the statistics on Mr. Irrelevant. I became a starter my rookie year. I had achieved success, but because my why was completely wrapped up in my own agenda, it didn't have meaning, it didn't have purpose, and it was not sustainable. So I was living gutless. That's what pushed me to cope. As I took a year off, I, I, after rehab, I started to rehabilitate my mind and my body, and I was preparing to return to the league. But what I was doing was I was waking up my gut. I was taking the time to figure out who I was, what my gifts and, and, and skills were, and what I had just endured, and what the purpose of it was in my life. So as I began to soul search, the call came for me to return to the NFL. And in that moment, something was different. I thought I'd be excited, but I wasn't. So I decided to listen to my gut, even though it was scary even though I'd much rather take the paycheck in the NFL. Instantly, my brain tried to call me back, but I knew in my gut it was time to close that, that chapter. And I did. I moved to Dallas. I started a gym, started training elite athletes. Business was going well. And one day, driving home late from work, I was stressed out. I was tired. You know, my problems were so big. I was having a bad day. My wife called. It was late. Dinner was getting cold on the table. My two little girls are screaming in the background. She was less than thrilled. So I cut through a parking lot to dodge a traffic light, which is totally legal. And as I did that, out of the corner of my eye, I saw a man in a wheelchair with no legs. And I felt a deep tug in my gut. Instantly, my brain said, you don't have time. Your wife's going to kill you. You're tired. You're hungry, right? All justifiable reasons. But instead, this day, I was in tune to this. I slammed on the brakes, and I whipped it next to him. I hopped out of the car and I invited him to my gym to work out with me, not knowing the place he was in. But this combat injured Marine showed up the next day, the day after that. And for the next three months, we trained every day. I watched the life come back into his eyes. 
even though his body looked different, he was redefining his physicality. He was finding a new identity. Through that, I learned one thing. You can serve without compassion, but you can't do compassion without service. Compassion is never convenient. Let me say that again because it's rich. You can serve without compassion, but you can't offer compassion without service because compassion is not convenient. What I'm telling you is that the gut has massive value if you'll listen. It's worth being tuned into because you're going to be able to assess situations and then act and help those in need or even help yourself. Think about a time maybe you've been in a relationship and you knew in your gut it wasn't right, but your head wanted to believe it was. Right on paper it was. So you stayed with that person because you didn't want to hurt them. Some of you may be there right now. But you're doing yourself and that person a disservice. You see, the supply and demand in today's world through my lens is that your supply, your gifts, your talents, your experiences, the adversity that you've faced, that's the supply and the demand is to change the world for someone right in front of you. It doesn't take anything extraordinary. We like to make leaders those who change the world, right? We just marginalize our own capability and we put it conveniently out of our reach. But the truth is that in our daily lives, we have an opportunity to deal hope, and the gut is the best compass to do that. So this led me to recognizing a need for a person, right, person with disabilities, then a, recognized a void for a larger demographic. There's over 10 million Americans with a physical disability. So I designed a training methodology to assess them and train them to restore hope through movement, okay? This is what caused me to start my nonprofit, the Adaptive Training Foundation, which does just that. We offer them an opportunity through psychosocial healing to redefine their lives. I'm often referred to as a sweat psychologist, someone who uses weights and conditioning to reach their clients. Because again, we can give a veteran a home, we can give them a job, but if they don't have an identity, none of that will be sustainable. What's happening inside of my gym is that these adaptive athletes, these people that have been ostracized for a long time, have been left on the sidelines, they're now getting into the game. Not only are they finding themselves again, but as they do that, they recognize that they too can pay it forward. They're teaching able-bodied people like you and me, what's our excuse? So what, my plan from a national level is to change policy. The same way that there's a handicapped parking spot outside of a large corporate gym, I expect there to be an ADA handicapped certified trainer inside that gym. That's progress. And this is how we can scale to reach a global need. You guys, it's critical to wake your gut up. I challenge you in closing today to go and wake your gut up for it is the genesis of your highest calling and through service that excites you, change the world for someone today. Thank you so much.